Welcome to worship on this third Sunday of Easter. I am Scott Cox, Senior Minister at Speedway Christian Church, and it is good to have you join for worship. I have a few announcements I want to share with you. First of all, Children's Sunday School continues at 10.30 a.m. each Sunday. This will be for ages four through fifth grade. Youth group, and that will be sixth grade through 12th grade, meets at 5.30 p.m. on Sundays. You can find out information about this by checking your email and the church's Facebook. In both those places, there will be links uh, so you can join either of the groups. There continues to be a study group on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. that's led by me. If you're interested in joining it, it is a fun group. We have good discussion, good conversation. And if you would like to join that group, just let me know either by sending me an email or by uh, calling me. Feel free to do that as well. One other thing is that there was a board meeting this past Tuesday and we discussed the process for uh, determining when we would return to in-person worship and activities. At this point, things continue to be up in the air. We're monitoring the situation by listening to scientists and doctors, to our governor, to the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Indiana region. Uh, as we uh, make decisions related to that, we certainly will keep you posted. We'll get word out uh, to let you know when we might be returning to worship in person and to other activities in person. But again, uh, things continue to be up in the air. And we will, of course, worship in this format and also have meetings in this format in the weeks ahead, just as we have been doing. Again, welcome to worship. God bless you as we seek to listen to the voice of God in this time together. God holds out to us this promise of new life, life as unpredictable, as unrehearsed, as explosive as life at the very beginning. God calls us to respond to this gift with creativity, with joy, and with courage. And worship, in worship, we begin to accept this gift of new life. Let us worship God. Let us pray together. God of resurrection, we cry out to you as empty people in a fractured world. 
We live in a world of Good Fridays, where innocent people suffer and die, where midday darkness smothers the light, where hopes and dreams dissolve, where evil seems to triumph. God of resurrection, we long to discover your presence. We long to feel the rhythm of your power. We stumble toward the tombs of our lives and long to find them empty. Bring Easter to our hearts today. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, whose life and love could not be stamped out, whose resurrection hope is the hope which plants love and laughter in our lives and lures them to sprout and bloom and blossom like spring flowers in the morning sun. Amen. The scripture I would like to share with you this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Let us hear this word now for us, the people of God. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all of these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us they had indeed seen a vision of angels who had said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So we went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread. He blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. <laughs> then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while we were talking to him in, on the road? while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and what had been, known, had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Amen. Hi, everyone. This is our children's moment, a time for all of our children and for all of those who are young at heart to come gather around as we listen to our story. So today's Bible story is another one 
about something that happened after Jesus had risen from the dead. Remember that last week we met a man named Thomas, and Thomas wasn't too sure that Jesus had actually risen from the dead, and he really needed to meet Jesus and touch him and talk to him to really believe what had happened, to really believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. Today, we have a kind of similar story. Today's story is about two other people, Cleopas and Simon. They were walking to a town called Emmaus. They walked seven miles to get to this town. They walked it. They were, and as they were walking to this town, they met Jesus, but they didn't know that it was Jesus. So Jesus was like, hey, what are you guys talking about? And Cleopas goes, what do you think we're talking about? Jesus died. And they're telling all of this to Jesus because they didn't recognize him. And Jesus is playing dumb. Jesus is acting like he hasn't heard the news that this guy Jesus had risen from the dead. Okay, so Cleopas and Simon filled their new friend, who was really Jesus, in on who Jesus was and what had happened to him. So Cleopas and Simon, they get to where they are going and invited Jesus to come to dinner with him. In Jesus' time, being welcome and inviting other people to your house and to have dinner with you and your family was really, really important. So Jesus went with them, and he went, they, he went into their home, and he had dinner with them. And the Bible says, when he was at the table with them, he took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. Where do we hear words like that sometimes in worship? Do you remember? That's right. It's during communion. So Jesus said this, he gave them the bread, and the disciples were like, oh my gosh, it's Jesus. What do you think that means? What do you think this story can teach us? Cleopas and Simon didn't recognize who Jesus really was until they broke bread together, until they had dinner together. I think the same is true with communion. Sometimes we forget that we are all God's people. We fight with each other. Nations start wars with each other. We don't love each other like we should. And I think one of the reasons why we sometimes fight like that is because we forget that we are all God's children. We forget that God loves you and me just as much, just as much as those people that we don't like. And so I think that shows us that we should love each other, that we should treat each other fairly, that we have to share with each other, even when we don't want to, because, God, because that's how God wants us to treat other people. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, we thank you for all of the things that you teach us every day and for all of the ways that you show up in our lives, helping us and leading us along. Amen.
Let us pray. Awaken us, God, with truth so big, so glorious, words don't contain it. Awaken us with love that overcomes all. During this Easter season, open our eyes to see your loving, reconciling work in the world. Open our ears so we may hear your voice and the voices of others. Open our hearts to a love that comes to each of us and assures us that there is nothing to fear ever because Jesus Christ, our Lord, is risen. Amen. Two downhearted, discouraged, disillusioned, and depressed followers of Jesus were walking to Emmaus. Jesus had been crucified, and they knew that this was the end of the story. He would never be heard from again. There was no other way of looking at what had happened. He was dead and gone. Then they were joined incognito by the risen Jesus. Jesus asked them, what are you talking about? And one of the two named Cleopas said, are you the only one who hasn't heard what happened? And Jesus responded, what's that? And Cleopas said, as we heard, Jesus of Nazareth, the mighty prophet, was seized by the political and religious authorities and put to death. And we hoped that he was the one who would establish the reign of God in Jerusalem. And not only this, some women have been to his tomb and it is empty. They are saying that they had a vision of angels who said he had risen from the dead. But some others went to the tomb and it is true that his body wasn't there, but they didn't see any evidence that he had risen from the dead. It was an understandable conclusion that they made. When a person is dead, they are dead. We know what it means to come to a dead end and know just know that there are no other options. A broken relationship, a job we didn't get, or downsizing in a company, being transferred to another community because a job requires us to move, not getting into the college we hope to, the death of someone we love. We all have had dead ends in our lives. There have been seemingly no options. We have become as discouraged as those two on the road to Emmaus. We may feel that the comedian is correct who said that sometimes we face a crossroad. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness, the other to total extinction. Let us pray that we have the wisdom to choose correctly. But if we have been working at this thing called life for very long, we know that closed doors don't mark the end of God's work in our lives. We have experienced something painful, and it may not feel that something good will eventually emerge, but if we live long enough, we know that in time, the pain does pass, and something good that we could not have imagined sometimes does emerge. Scars may remain in our lives, but God can even use these scars to deepen our relationship with God and with others and even with ourselves. God can take our scars and make us more empathetic and compassionate people. I underscore that God doesn't cause the pain, but given the fact that we have experienced it, God sometimes brings something good out of it. The pain caused by a slam door can also be redeemed because God can take pain and bring resurrection out of it. Just as Mary Magdalene learned in our scripture last week, Cleopas and the unnamed disciple in our reading today learned that God provides options other than despair, hopelessness, and total extinction. God has a strange habit of bringing life out of death. God says there is always hope, even when we feel that we have come to a dead-end street. This does not mean that there is no hurt. During the Lent and Easter seasons, we know that there is crucifixion and it's painful. But with God, there is resurrection. God brings forth an option of new life in the midst of the deadness of our lives. Looking back over our lives, we can even say that sometimes, and I emphasize, sometimes things have worked out for the best, even when it has been painful to have a door slam in our face. 
In retrospect, we can sometimes say that when a door has closed, something better has emerged that never would have had the door not closed. New doors open that we could not have imagined. God brings resurrection to our lives when we think our circumstances are hopeless. Of course, there are some things that are so horrendous that I don't believe any good can come out of them. When someone goes through something horrendous, it is not helpful to say, God will bring something good out of it, or say, this was God's will. But there are those occasions when good does come out of pain. But as Mary Magdalene learned last week in our scripture reading, God is the God of other options, options that we never considered. God can take the option of hopelessness and replace it with the option of hope. God can take the options of downhearted and discouraged and despairing and depressed and replace them with the option of joy. One of the reasons that we may think that we have no other option is because we limit God to our limited minds, our limited resources, our limited gifts. You may have heard this before, God has no hands but our hands to do God's work today. God has no feet but our feet to lead others in God's way. It continues. God has no voice but our voice, and God has no help but our help. I understand the thinking behind these words. These words are a call to get off of our behinds and go to work for God. If it weren't for humans using their minds and ingenuity and gifts, then the world would be in worse shape than it is. But if God is limited to what we can do as human beings, then I have to say that God is in deep trouble. There would have been no resurrection if it had been left to us. Because God isn't limited to what we humans do, God is at work in our lives and in the world nudging and pulling us along. Those two despondent followers of Jesus began to believe that God would make things well in their lives when they came to realize that the stranger who joined them on the road and joined them around the supper table was none other than the risen Christ. You may have noticed the language that Luke uses in describing their time around the table. We heard it just a few minutes ago. Luke says, when Jesus was at the table with them, he took bread blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. He took bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. We hear those words many times in worship service. Luke almost certainly had communion in mind. Remember that Luke wasn't merely reporting what happened to these two followers of Jesus. He was writing to his church, and they were probably asking, does the risen Christ appear to us? And if so, how does he appear? Luke was telling them one of the ways that the risen Christ appeared to them was at communion. Every time we gather around the table of communion, Christ is present among us. This is something we can count on every week. And if Christ is present with us at the table, Maybe, just maybe, Christ is present every day wherever we are. Luke goes on to tell us that Christ departed from them in the same way it seemed to Luke's church, and it seems to us that the risen Christ isn't present to us as he was to those first believers. But notice that Luke tells us that after Jesus left, after Cleopas and the other person began to reflect on their experience on the road between Jerusalem and, and Emmaus, they said, you know, come to think of it, when we were walking, our hearts were burning within us as we interpreted, or as he interpreted, the scripture. Luke is telling us that not only does the risen Christ appear to us at the Lord's table, but he comes to us as we read and interpret scripture. Luke was telling his church, just as he would tell us, that during worship, Christ comes to us through communion and through the reading and interpreting of scripture. 
Sometimes, though, we don't recognize them until we look back and reflect, just as those two did. They remembered what had happened on the road. At the time, they did not recognize Christ, but in retrospect, they did. Now, there are many times that I don't know what God wants me to do. I've had some burning bush experiences like Moses had that seem to confirm that God is present and seem to give me clarity and direction. But I'll be honest, I have not had many of those experiences. What I have been given instead were choices. I prayed about them. I consulted with friends. I tried to utilize my brain and some common sense and listen to my gut, and then I stepped out. I don't know about you, maybe you have more certainty when it comes to God than I do, but what happens to me more often than not is that it is in retrospect that I come to the conclusion that God has been with me. That's what Cleopas and the other unnamed follower of Jesus experienced. So often it's after an event, when we have had time to reflect, that we can say, you know, I really didn't recognize it at the time, but as I look back on it, I can say that Christ was with me. In retrospect, some of our most profound insights and experiences happen in that way. It might be words spoken at a funeral that will help us through a time of grieving as we recall those words down the road. And not just words spoken by the minister at the funeral, but words spoken by friends who encouraged us when they came to pay their respects. And it's not just after painful experiences that we can look back and say, God was with me. When a couple stands before minister and friends and family and they say, I do, they can't fully comprehend the implications of what they have said. If they stay together, they will spend a lifetime living into those vows. They will look back and remember what they said, and it will sustain them through good times and difficult times in sickness and in health. And at a time of worship, we may think, oh, nothing really happened. But sometime in time of need, we might recall a hymn or an anthem that the choir sang or prayer that an elder spoke or the words of a sermon or time around the table, and we'll be able to say, you know, I think my heart was burning a little. Maybe the risen Christ is with me after all. As we go to God in prayer today, we hold in our hearts all those who are struggling mentally, physically, spiritually. We hold all those who are in pain, those who are longing to see God's presence in their lives and to feel God's warmth in their hearts. So as we go to a time of prayer, let us begin with a moment of silence 
so that we might raise our individual, our personal prayers to God. Let us pray. Holy God, like those disciples on the road to Emmaus, we sometimes struggle to recognize you in the everyday journey of our lives. We seek your wisdom in the midst of the questions we have about the circumstances we find ourselves in. Open our eyes, gracious God, to your work of transformation in and all around us. As we walk with you day by day, may your new life be made manifest in what we say to others. Help us to understand the power of our words to heal or to hurt. Give us the graciousness to make all of our conversations holy. As you opened the scriptures to the disciples and taught them everything, open our eyes to behold you in the stories you have shared with us, in the love and laughter of our family and friends, in the beauty all around us. And in our seeing, help us to recognize and welcome the stranger in our midst. May our welcome be a celebration of the gifts and grace of people who are different from us, and not merely some token tolerance of an outsider. You come to us in unexpected places, in a crowded room, in a journey on a dusty road, in conversation, in stillness. You come in the midst of our doubt, our fear, our sorrow. You come in the power of the resurrection. So often we forget, Holy One, that you invite us to abide with you. And so we thank you that you travel with us through all of our days. Amen. Jesus calls us to reach out to those in need. This, of course, is because of God's love for them and our love for God and people. I think that Jesus also knew that it brings great joy to give. We receive as much in return as those to whom we reach out. It also brings great joy to give financially to our church in order to support our ministry. Thanks for your faithfulness to this during these COVID-19 days. There are three ways to contribute to the church. You can do so through a check, which can be mailed to the church. You can set up automatic giving. You can talk to your bank about that. This is the way that I contribute, and I find that it certainly simplifies things. You can also go to our website at www.speedwaychristian.org. You will find an icon for Givelify, and you can contribute through that resource. Again, thank you for your continued support of the church. Let us pray. Oh God, through the offering of these gifts, may we become a more open people, open-minded in hearing your call, open-minded in healing a broken world, open-handed in heeding your call for an acted love, with thanks for all good gifts, we present a portion of our substance and the whole of ourselves. Amen.
was at the table where their eyes were opened. It was at the table where they recognized Jesus, the risen Lord. It is at this table where we replay that moment every time we gather, as Jesus did. We take the bread, we break it, we share it, and then we go and we tell others what has been made known to us in the breaking of the bread. Our God, we gather here as a people of faith to seek the peace that was promised us. Please calm our souls. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus walked with his disciples following his resurrection. We remember and believe. To the doubtful disciples, Jesus explained God's purpose in sending Jesus to show love in the world. We remember and believe. And to the eleven in the upper room, Jesus blessed bread and wine. We remember and believe. Be with us those times we doubt. Lead us to a deeper faith. And may we be God's face of love to all that we meet. Join now as we say the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so now we remember the night that Jesus gathered around the table with his brothers for their final Passover meal together. And as they were eating, he took the bread that was before them and he blessed it and he broke it and he handed it to each of them, saying, my friends, this is my body given for you. Take and eat of it, all of you. And then he took the cup and he said, this cup is of the covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of the sins of many. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and we drink from this holy cup of grace, we remember Christ until he comes again. Let us pray. Holy One, we pray that the Holy Spirit would descend upon us and upon these gifts of bread and cup, and that in sharing them, we may be guided forward by your presence. We thank you for Jesus, who, throughout his life, death, and resurrection, fully lived according to your will, so that we will come to know you through who he was and continues to be. Help us to go forward now and tell others what has been known to us in the breaking of the bread. Amen.
sisters and brothers. Go as those who have met with Christ on this day. Go as those whose hearts have burned within them as the scriptures have been explained. Go as those who have experienced the resurrection. And may the blessing of God be upon you in mind and body and in spirit as you leave this place. Amen.